Hello everyone, and today we will talk about the House of Tudor, which reigned England from the years 1485 to 1603. The House of Tudor is descended from the Welsh House of Tudor, as well as from France, being from Catherine of France. This 100 years is an era marked by changes in women's rights, changes in religion, rebellions, succession fights, and overall disorder. Now, the first monarch of the House of Tudor is Henry VII, followed by his son, Henry VIII, then his son, Edward VI, and then Mary I and Elizabeth I. Now, if you counted, that's five monarchs. Some historians would argue there were six. The sixth possible being Jane Grey, who ruled from nine days between Edward VI reign and Mary I. Jane Grey's other name was Jane Dudley, so I guess when the people of England realized that, they, they thought, well, they're cool at all, but we can't have a monarch who sounds like Jared Dudley. So then they had Mary put her in the Tower of England to cut her head off. I guess that was also a start of another trend, being Bloody Mary. So, the House of Tudor came into power during the War of the Roses, a war that was fought between the House of Lancaster and the House of York. The House of Tudor was closely aligned with the House of Lancaster, and when the House of Lancaster ran out of male descendants, the House of Tudor naturally became the leader to that side of the war, at which point the leader then became Henry VII. Henry VII would eventually gain the right to the throne by right of conquest after his victory at the Battle of Bosworth Field on August 27, 1485. Notice how Henry has right of conquest, but not these two. I guess this is evidence that winners get to write history and winners change people's perspective on history. So, Henry VII. Henry VII became king in 1445 and then married Elizabeth of York on 18th of January 1486. Elizabeth of York was a descendant of Edward IV and part of the aforementioned House of York, thus uniting both the House of Lancaster and the House of York, the two original sides of the Battle of the, Ro the War of the Roses. The royal emblem was also changed. You got the red from the House of Lancaster and the white from the House of York, showing that the House of Tudor is in alignment of both. Now, Henry VII and Elizabeth will have four children who will survive infancy. The eldest being Arthur, Arthur Prince of Wales, next being King Henry the Eighth, although technically at that time, Henry, Duke of York. The third is Margaret, who would marry James the Fourth of Scotland, and then Mary, who married Louis the Seventh of France. In 1501, King Henry the Seventh married his eldest son, Arthur, Arthur, to Catherine of Aragon, daughter of Spanish monarchs Ferdinand II and Isabel, Isabella I, solidifying a Spanish alliance with England. Arthur would die, unfortunately, the next year in 1502 at the age of 16, leaving Henry, Duke of York, as the only male descendant alive and thus the heir apparent. Now, obviously, because political alliances are more important than it is weird to marry your brother's wife, Henry VII obtained a papal dispensation, which allowed his son, Prince Henry, to marry Catherine. Politically, Henry VII would end up going to war with Scotland before making peace and then marrying Margaret to the King James IV of Scotland. Funny enough, he did do this twice because Henry VII also went to war with France. Although, to be fair, you can't blame him for that. That's a British royal tradition to go to war with France. And he would end that war, and then his daughter Mary would marry King Louis of VII of France. Economically, though, Henry VII built up the royal treasury. The War of the Roses has caught England, which was already at that time not one of the wealthiest countries in Europe, to become one of the poorest nations in Europe. Henry VII, throughout his reign, built up quite a bit of money for his son Henry VIII, which is needed for war and divorce. Historically, it is debatable whether Henry VII was a great king from policy, from a policy standpoint, but regardless of the position of that matter, it is well known that he is a successful one, having united a nation, established the House of Tudor, and therefore future reign and restored English, English wealth. Now his son Henry VIII would succeed him to become king. King Henry VIII is one of the most famous English monarchs and thus there's not really much to talk about. Henry VIII's reign was known for his divorces. His strategy of popularity by divorce I guess is still being carried out in places like Hollywood for example the Kardashian family. 
going by the King Henry VIII playbook. King Henry VIII, though, did establish a Church of England with himself as the head. From this point forward, England would be a Protestant rather than a Roman Catholic country. Some interesting facts about King Henry VIII is that as a child and young adult, he was known as, and I am quoting here, gently, gentle friendliness, gentle debate, someone who acted more like a companion than a king. Makes you wonder, in fact, if King Henry VIII wrote that himself. Next was King Edward VI, the son of James Seymour, who succeeded his father's throne in the year 1547. He was only nine years old at the time. His reign would begin at a time when nobles were trying to strengthen their own power rather than supporting the young king in his duties. His reign would be marked by different quote unquote Lord protectors who use the term protecting the king as I am going to do everything. They called this as a term regency politically. We call it a power grab. Throughout Edward VI's reign, he would strip England of Catholic symbols and fully embrace the country's rapidly growing Protestant identity. These reforms would even include a revised Book of Common Prayer, completely splitting Protestant, a Protestant country from a Roman Catholic one. Edward, after marrying Mary, the Queen of Scots, would attempt and fail to force the English Reformation on the Church of Scotland. Ed Edward VI became seriously ill in 1553 and was desperate for a new heir. Mary, the heir appointed by his father, was a Catholic. Afraid that Mary would overturn all the Protestant reforms, Edward named Jane Grey or Jane Dudley as heir. She would rule for an ast astonishingly long nine days. <laughs> Following Jane Grey, Mary I, the next, the or the present heir appointed by Edward VI's father, King Henry VIII, would become queen. Queen Mary I of England, Bloody, better known as Bloody Mary, succeeded the throne in 1554. Mary began her reign by announcing her intention of marrying the Spanish Prince Philip. This decision was unpopular with the English people, who feared that this would cause England to be a satellite state of France. As discontent grew among the people, the Protestant Thomas Wyatt led a rebellion against Mary, hoping to dispose of the Catholic believing queen and favorite. Queen Elizabeth I, who was a Protestant. Thomas Wyatt's plan of rebellion was discovered, however, and he was captured and tortured. Mary hoped that he would provide evidence of Elizabeth's involvement, allowing her to kill her half-sister, although he never did. Wyatt was eventually beheaded, and Elizabeth spent her time rotating between all the prisons Mary could think of, mainly, though, the Tower of England. Despite the people's anger, Mary would end up marrying, ha ha ha, Philip in 1554. Unfortunately, Philip never found Mary attractive and thus would never have children throughout her five-year reign. Mary's bad temper, perhaps due to never having an heir, led her to resort to violent ways of disposing of the Protestant beliefs in her country. Her most famous attempt, known as the Marian Persecution, per Persicians, saw 200 to 300 Protestants burned at the stake. These violent attempts just led to more, a more united Protestant country. The last nail in the coffin in Mary's dreams of a Catholic England, England was hammered in when she lost Calais, the last piece of England land on French territory. This defeat would lead to the end of the monarch of England also claiming to be the monarch of France. Despite the humanitarian and military disasters, because there's not any way, other way to put that other than disasters during the reign of Queen Mary I, her economic policy was actually greatly impactful. Although Mary, Mary's marriage, ha 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 ha, with Prince Philip did not result in any heirs, it did lead to advanced trade relations with Spain. Mary also arranged for the first Russian diplomat to come to England, opening up trade between these two countries. She would give more electricity economic control to local towns than ever happened before, creating an almost halfway federalist system. Throughout her reign, she worked to reverse inflation, decrease deficit, and poverty. Although Mary's reign will always be remembered as Bloody Mary for all the Protestants she killed, she was beneficial in setting up English, England's economy so that and international relationships and trade so that Queen Elizabeth could be the great monarch we know today. Queen Elizabeth I was the Queen of England after the passing of Queen Mary. Known as the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth I never married, even though she was never so short of suitors. 
This would lead to the end of the House of Tudors reign after Queen Elizabeth's death. Despite this, the House of Tudors bloodline, though, was passed through females with the House of Stuart, House of Hanover, and the current House of Windsor. Throughout Elizabeth's reign, she managed the economy in such a way that the country was in credit rather than debt. An astonishing feat, considering just six generations earlier, England was one of the poorest countries in all of Europe. Elizabeth defined what it meant to be a government for the people, as she did not marry people, she did, she did not marry anyone, partially because the public disagreed, she would have governed based on the public's interest. She also demonstrated her care for the public, as by her, through her, through a law she enforced called the Poor Law, which gave government subsidies during bad harvests, something that was rare at that time period. Elizabeth's brain also showed a bigger picture, though, and that was more impactful today because it showed that a rule or leader by a female could be just as great as a male one. All right, so today that is the video on the House of Tudor. The War of the Roses and the Reign of King Henry VIII were only briefly discussed because I think they're their own video. Speaking of the House of Tudor still being passed on today, just not through males, these people are actually descendants, although I'm not sure how Queen Elizabeth would exactly think of these two.